vigor is nice if you can make it into yield. And in order to make vigor into yield, you need to put CO2, temperature, EC, whatever to do to make that plant generative. But if price of, of energy is going up, you cannot, it's, it's, it's too costly to make that, that plant generative. So we see that growers also are thinking of going towards more generative, not weak, but more generative rootstocks. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Martin van Stey to the Growing for Market podcast. Martin is the crop breeding manager for tomatoes at Enza Zaden, a Dutch seed company that breeds a lot of vegetable varieties that are popular with many of the market farmers who are probably in our audience. And if I'm not mistaken, Martijn, uh, Zaden means seeds in Dutch. So it's basically Enza seeds if you translated that into English. Is that right? Correct, 100% correct. And Enza, uh, uh, by the way, is Enkhuizen Zaden. So Enza already is an abbreviation of Enkhuizen, the city in Holland, and Zaden uh, with the seats. So it's even more. Yeah. Oh, per perfect. Okay. I, yeah, I didn't know that. More to the point today, uh, we have been getting a lot of questions about the use of grafted tomatoes for increased production and disease resistance. So I thought it would be interesting to have someone on the pod who knows a lot about that. Martijn got his start at Enza in 2003, so 20 years ago, as a rootstock breeder. And then for the last 10 years, he has been responsible for the greenhouse, rootstock, and small-fruited tomato market at Enza. So, Martijn, thank you so much for beaming in from Holland to be with us today. It's a pleasure, uh, Andrew. It's really a pleasure. Oh, good. Um, well, it's fun for me to meet you because for seven years I was doing the trialing on greenhouse tomatoes and rootstocks, including doing the grafting at one of your distributors here in the USA called Johnny Selected Seeds. In fact, I was part of the team that trialed and added the rootstock Estamino, which is an Enza variety, a number of years ago, which I see they and other seed companies are still selling today. So. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm getting to meet the artist behind an unsigned painting today and that we don't usually know which people specifically bred a certain variety. And of course, it's usually a team working on any single variety. Uh, did you work on Estamino? I was, it was one of my first commercial hybrids, uh, in fact. It was my second hybrid ever as a young breeder uh, uh, yeah, becoming commercial. So Estamino oh. for me has really, uh, yeah, bring back history in a way uh, for me. That's so much fun. I was I was thinking that if you were if you were doing that, uh, you know, ten years ago, that you might you might have had a hand in that. So that's really cool. Um, exactly. Can can you say a few words about Enza? I think a lot of the growers here in the U.S. and Canada who may have grown Enza varieties may not even realize it because. Though some companies do it, most companies here don't note who the breeder is on varieties in their, their yeah. catalog. So can you just tell like people a little yeah. bit about Enza? Sure. Um, Enza is a, still a family company. It's something we are very proud of eh? in the business. Nowadays, there are not that much family companies left anymore. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm also still working at Enza, the, the, the family feeling. Um, founded more than 80 years ago. Uh, by the uh, Jacob Masereel, which is uh, nowadays we have the third generation as uh, the CEO. Um, uh, so uh, still the Masereel family is uh, is leading the company. Um, we are active in well every well every area of the world uh, with many many crops, uh, fruities like pepper and tomato and and, and cukes, uh, but also uh, very strong lettuce, uh, herbs. Uh, and, and lately also in, um, in broccoli, watermelon, um, asparagus. So, and we do that in all the continents uh, from Asia to the, North America and everything uh, in between. So it's uh, uh, becoming uh, yeah, a major player, or it is a major player in the, in the seed world. However, it's not feeling like that if you work there. So that's the, the nice thing. Uh, you don't feel corporate. But in a way, looking at the size, and we are becoming very, yeah, a very big, uh, big company. 
Yeah, well, I would say so. I mean, I trialed a lot of Enzo varieties back when I was doing trialing, and I thought very highly of them. You know, they were usually high quality and, you know, good disease resistances and, and you know, grower-friendly varieties. So exactly. yeah. I think that's true. Um, how did you become a rootstock breeder? Can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got interested in breeding rootstocks and other tomatoes? Yeah, well, not specifically breeding rootstock, but... Sure. Uh, I come from an agricultural family. My 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 parents were farmer uh, in Holland, and well, it was the idea uh, that I took over the the family company. Uh, so I studied. Uh, I did my bachelor plant science with the idea that Martijn, you have the knowledge to go to the next generation of farmers. Mm -hmm. That having said, all through the the time I was living and working on the farm, I was intrigued by the seeds. You sow something so small. And in the end of the cycle, you get a sugar beet or you get an onion or barley or whatever. I was, I was intrigued by that. So the last year of my, my bachelor, I did a specialization in plant breeding and biotechnology. Yeah, and there it went wrong. There I fell in love with plant breeding. So I did my master in Wageningen University to, to study plant breeding. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, my parents sold uh, the farm because mm -hmm. I was there. Uh, I, I, I supposed to be their follow up, and I decided to go into the world of plant breeding. So that succeeded in 2002, and then uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I did my job interview at Enza, and they had a vacancy for uh, for tomato breeding. I was the youngest tomato breeder at that time, uh, so yeah, really full of energy to to make a difference, um, and still intrigued by the. So small seed can deliver such amount of tomatoes or pepper or whatever. Right? It's, for me, that's still a miracle. And, and to contribute to make it even a bigger miracle, still that wakes, uh, that keeps me uh, passionate and energized every single day uh, uh, yeah, of the week. So, yeah, a very short, I started to be a farmer, some becoming a farmer. But, yeah, I choose to go into the plant breeding world. Yeah, well, I mean, all, the farmers need plant breeders, so that's uh, you know still a very important job to be doing. Can I just ask you really briefly, was your family doing greenhouse growing or was it field production or what, what kind of family farm what was it? No, field, field production, potatoes, onions, uh, sugar beets. So that were the most, the three biggest, and then uh, barley wheat for the uh, crop rotation mainly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so really, uh, yeah, from outdoor to uh, it was the at Enza, it was the first time I went ever into the greenhouse. So it's it's really uh, another world for me opened uh, when I was uh, started to work at Enza. Yeah. 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 It sounds like it. Well, I guess to touch a little more on what you're doing today, I'm I'm just curious to ask what the development process is like there at Enza. I I imagine a team setting a goal for varieties. I imagine you know saying we need a really high vigor rootstock with resistances to specific diseases or something like that. And then you let your breeders go to work, and then you get together and see how the varieties have performed and whether they're an improvement or good enough to release or. Or something like that. Is that anywhere exactly. near what the well, development process is actually like for you there at Enza? Hi, over. You, you are 100% right. But to go a little bit more in detail, you mentioned also in the introduction, it's, it's clearly a teamwork. Eh? A breeder does not wake up with the idea, this is what a grower wants, I'm going to make it. Um, we have an um, extensive team of marketing and sales uh, uh, colleagues. We have product management. And together, breeding, product management, and sales management – are coming together and say, okay, what is the product model? What do you hear from the, the grower? What do you hear from the market, uh, the retail? With rootstock, that's a less, uh, less of a thing, but in general, in tomato, retail is also an important factor. That together comes to a product model. And that's, uh, it has to have, uh, it has to germinate at least X percentage. It has to be uniform. It has to be this amount of figure compared with this standard variety. So really smart, eh? really that you can measure it. And if we together agree with it, then it's like a contract. Do we agree that this is the product our breeders are going to make? Yes. Then that product model goes into the breeding team. And then we can say, okay, what do we need in order to get there? What kind of facilities do we need? Do we need more 
greenhouse space together or do we need a more production space or, or, or laboratory space, whatever. whatever. So we, that's the moment we make it smart and operational. And then every year, several times a year, of course, we, we check in with our product management, with our uh, marketing sales colleagues and say, hey, this is where we are. We are not there yet, but uh, these are the steps we are making. Um, so also marketing sales can, can talk with their growers, say, hey, yes, we understood you, we listened to you, and our breeders are on that way. We are not there yet, but uh, we are uh, going towards the direction of this new resistance or this, this extra figure you, you, you are asking for. And we also, of course, uh, do that uh, based on market data. We cannot run after every interesting topic. And we also prioritize which topic is more, even more important than the other. So right. that I honestly have to say, it's not, oh, you want something? Of course, because I like you. Uh, I, I'm going to work uh, for that. So some, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, good. I, I hope that gives listeners a, an idea of what the development process is, uh, yeah. because I think despite the fact that um, growers are planting seeds all the time, the, the development in breeding process of new varieties is a little bit obscure. Like I think that there's not, most people don't really understand how it works. So I, and I wanted to make sure that's why I asked if that was, if that development process was anything like I, I imagined it to be. So it sounds like it is, you know, it, it is, but it's really time consuming. Eh? It's, and, and that's the, the thing. Yeah, sometimes it's the obscure part. Uh, sometimes it feels like a black box. Eh? We, we say it to the breeding companies yeah, and then we expect next year to come with a solution. And unfortunately, that's, yeah, that's not the case. Uh, normal variety development is at least five to seven years, and then we, uh, everything goes well. So that's, uh, that's the, 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 the thought about it. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Well, that's a good point, that even though there are new varieties that come out every year maybe not in every crop every year but like this is the time where growers in this country are, have probably gotten their seed catalogs in the mail in you know november december and open it up see what the new varieties are and you know there's always new varieties but yeah. it's easy to forget that those new varieties may be at the tail end of what what you said a five to seven year development process most of the time those new varieties came from an idea of five years ago so yeah. yes they are new but Maybe that problem, uh, we saw the first the talks about a, a certain possible problem. We heard already five years ago. Um, so we had to anticipate. From what, we have to look at the future a little bit. What do we think is the next big thing yeah, in five years from now? So that's, that's yeah, difficult. But if you do that as a team, then at least yeah, you make it a bit less difficult. Right, right. Because that's... Um... An important part of your network, I know, because I've, I've met a lot of the people that work for Enzo over the years, mm -hmm. the, every country and even region that you work in, right? You have people on the ground who are listening to growers and the growers say like, oh, like, I like this variety, but now we have tomato spotted wilt virus and I can't grow it anymore. I need, I need this variety with TSWV or like this variety grows great, but it doesn't taste as good. Can, can you make this, but this variety, but tasting better or whatever and so then it's exactly. like another five to seven year process okay. more yielding more more flexible and and yeah that that we hear i would not say every day but quite often and luckily yeah. all that input comes together and is discussed with the breeding team so um and that i think is the most important part the touch with the market because in the end yeah I'm not buying all the tomato seeds. The growers, eh, we do this for the growers. So <laughs> that's that's the, the. So we have to well, listen and 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 also think to, to think ahead, like big teams, like labor or, or changing climate. Yeah, if you ask five years ago, maybe labor or ten years ago, maybe labor was less of an issue, at eh, the shortage. But we already have to think: how can we? Could this be a team in a few years, five to ten years from now? So uh, years ago, we already start working on those those big teams, they they com complex traits. Is it ever frustrating to be uh, breeding? Because you know, as soon as you come out with a good variety, 
people will be like, okay, great. Make something better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it depends on your personality. But for me, as being very result driven and uh, uh, enthusiastic, uh, passionate, yes, it's, it can be very frustrating uh, that you are so happy to get your first commercial variety or your, 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 the thing which is really the best you have. And the first reaction is, yeah, a nice, Martijn, very, well, looks good. And then always there is this, but can you also make this in a, in a more yielding one or more resistance for this? Or, yeah, yeah. But, well, that comes with the jump, they say, but it will never, uh, I never get used to that. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe it's more uh, productive to think of it as job security, right? <laughs> you're never, you're never going to be done. Exactly. Uh, that, that's the positive thing. <laughs> I don't have to worry for my job, at least uh, from the biological part of, point of view. Yeah, correct. Yeah, okay. So a lot of what we're here to talk about today is grafting. And I wanted to ask you about it, uh, really the history to sort of place our conversation. Because I've always been told that the commercial use of vegetable grafting, specifically tomato grafting, took off in Dutch greenhouses in the 1970s. I mean, it's been known that trees can be grafted for thousands of years. And I know grafted grapevines have been used since Roman times and have been pretty much standard since the late 1800s. But my understanding mm -hmm. was that commercial grafting in vegetables generally and tomatoes more specifically didn't really become widely used until the last century. Does that sound accurate to you? And do you have anything more to add to that? Correct. In the 70s, there was a need in Holland to, or a need, um, that came, became problems in, in soil-borne diseases. Holland, as you may know, is a small country. There is not that much space to grow vegetables. So crop rotation was not really something normal. So if you were, uh, if you grow in soil, yeah, soil-borne diseases will pop up. So grafting was needed because of the nematodes, fusarium, uh, uh, those kind of diseases. However, the techniques of grafting in the 70s were not so good yet. So it really took another 15, uh, close to 20 years to get a, the, the, the grafting technique uh, very cost efficient. Uh, before that, there were lots of um, uh, grafts which were failing. Germination in general of rootstocks was extremely low because priming, pelletin was not something what was a standard thing. So, uh, yes, in the 70s it started, but only on those cases where it was an issue. Mm -hmm. Commercially interesting, end of the 80s. There it really took a big jump as a commercial, close to normal uh, uh, thing to do. Close to normal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so started out to overcome the soil-borne disease resistances. The other part, like when people ask me, why, mm -hmm. why go to the, all this extra trouble to graft your tomato plants? You know, I do say soil-borne disease resistance and um, yield boost. And so did the yield boost come later on when people realized like, well, if we're graft if we're developing these varieties specifically just for use as roots then maybe we can make one that's just super vigorous has a really big root system and can just make the plant better with better roots exactly but that i, I must be honest there it was a bit of a collateral damage it was not the goal but by doing it they all of a sudden saw also a big figure increase a power increase yeah and in general uh, with growers if you have power you can tweak the power into yield. Uh, if you don't have figure, then you cannot move it into a more yielding plant. So you need energy in order to, to make that energy into more yield. So while grafting, they found out, hey, those grafted plants, they have more power. So we can put more energy in it in, in order to, to turn it into yield. So that was not the initial goal, but they found it out, out while doing so the initial goal was soil-borne diseases. And then they found out, wow, this gives also added value in, in, in terms of figure. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, yeah, and that's now twisted around now in, in Holland. The majority does it because of its figure. <laughs> and you can do it. So that's, yeah. But it yeah. started in, for soil-borne diseases. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, that is very interesting because a lot of times when I'm talking to growers about grafting, I tell them that, in my opinion, even if they don't have soil borne disease problems, that the the yield and vigor boost alone are are worth the cost of doing the grafting. And my, you know, my other comment is that sooner or later, a lot of people do get disease problems, and the way you find out is not a good way, right? So I figure, I figure, I yeah, the the because what you what we're saying is that the rootstocks are more vigorous than any sort of like garden variety tomato. And so yes. I, you know, I think growers sh will see a yield boost from that. And we, we can talk more about this later, but um, even I think the yield boost alone is worth doing it, but it's also just like cheap. It's cheap insurance uh, against when your soils do develop that disease, oh, even sure. if, you know, even if you don't have it yet, it's probably, I think mm -hmm. most people still just harvest more tomatoes. Uh, for grafting. And I don't have the exact numbers, but by far the majority is now using root stocks for its vigor. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, so especially in, in, in substrate grown, uh, but in general, vigor is the yeah, the biggest added value. But that's because that's kilos, that's yield. So that's uh, yeah, that's the main driver in in a way. Yeah. That's certainly what I saw. In fact, about thirteen to fifteen years ago. Um, I was doing a lot of trials on grafted plants, com comparing mm -hmm. different top varieties uh, grafted and then comparing those top varieties on their own roots versus top varieties or science, as they call them, on their own roots. And so uh, maybe I should back up. And if, if anybody's listening to this conversation, uh, you know, what, what we're talking about here is using a what we call a rootstock variety. So a variety of tomato or other other crop, but we're talking about tomatoes right now, That's that's been developed specifically for um, its soil-borne disease resistance and higher vigor. So take a, a top variety of tomatoes, I mean, it could be anything. Uh, it could be an heirloom tomato. I mean, like, for example, there's this heirloom that's very popular in the United States called Brandywine. And in my experience, it's kind of lowish vigor, low production. And so to my mind, you know, one way, if you really need to grow brandy wine, one way to get more out of brandy wine is to graft it onto a, a rootstock. Um, just because you'll have a stronger plant, which should result in a higher yield. And the other thing is that brandy wine doesn't have any known disease resistances, right? And so if you get fusarium, verticillium, well, there's a broad, a lot of things that can be bad for tomatoes in the ground, right? So, if you get any of those things, it'll actually be protected. I mean, to my mind, it's a great way to protect without using chemicals. It's a good way for organic growers to protect their plants uh, because one other thing that we'll probably get into today is that the, the rootstocks, because they're bred specifically for soil-borne diseases, they tend to have very broad um, soil-borne disease packages, right? So they protect against a lot of different soil-borne diseases. So that's, that's what we're talking about is taking taking any top variety of tomato, garden variety, whatever you want to call it, put it on any rootstock will tend to make the plant higher yielding, more vigorous and, and give it more, more disease resistance. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that I was doing probably about 15 years ago uh, was doing a lot of trials because we didn't have a lot of say yield data. We didn't have a lot of performance data. So, you know, uh, on on the the grafted plants and so i just did i did every permutation you can think of of just grafting top varieties onto root stocks and after a few years every single root stock trial that i did always was higher yielding the non-grafted plants in fact that's why so on my own farm i switched completely to grafted plants right and that that is a nice thing actually about being about working somewhere where you can do trials is because you can take a chance and say, I'm going to grow half the plants that are grafted, which the hypothesis is that they'll yield greater and mm -hmm. half of the plants ungrafted. So on their own roots. And let's see if our hypothesis is borne out that the, the grafted plants do better in, in every single trial that I did for the first few years or through my, all my time of doing these trials, the grafted plants always out yielded the ungrafted plants, right? And so that, you know, that was convincing to me. That's why I completely switched over to grafted plants. And a lot of growers here have too. But uh, back when I was visiting a lot of the bigger commercial greenhouses, 
thus, you know, ending about seven or eight years ago when I left to run the magazine, it seemed like maybe 80% of the big commercial growers here in North America were using grafted plants. So definitely a minority still using tomatoes on their own roots. Um, is that sound accurate to you? Can, can you confirm for me that most Dutch tomato growers are using grafted plants now? Is that accurate there? Yeah, in Holland, in Netherlands, 95%, if not more, is yeah. used in a rootstock. Yeah, they are grafting the plants just because the, the length of the season, the amount of energy they put in it, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, uh, yeah the, the added value is so big, what, what you also stated, it's a no-brainer oh, yeah, no to, uh, uh, to do grafting. Yeah, well, that, that's generally my recommendation to growers, too, is that they're going to get benefits out of using grafted plants. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it's really common in greenhouses. And even in uh, some field growers are doing it here. Like I know some growers in the, the southeastern and the southern United States where there's a lot of heat. A lot of humidity, not too much cold weather to kill the pathogens in the soil that they use grafted plants in the field to get around the verticillium and fusarium and all the all the the uh, all the things that might it might be just a difference between them being able to get a tomato crop at all versus exactly. putting plants into diseased soil where they just die. So I um, see that also often in, in the subtropics, in the tropics with bacterial wilt, uh, Ralstonia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that they they have to graft uh, against that resistance of a disease because else it's between having a crop or not having a crop. Uh, it's there is no option. Are there any situations where you would not recommend grafted plants or where that that's not um, counterindicated? Th then it will be a, a cost price thing. If mm -hmm. uh, if you have a very short cycle, for instance, in Spain there is a, a spring crop which is only uh, for a short cycle. In general, when you graft, often you see uh, the production started one week later, more or less, because the uh, plant needs to recover after, uh, after grafting. Um, and if you don't have a long cycle, I can imagine it may be costly to lose that first early cluster and to have two, to buy two seeds, uh, the cyan and the rootstock. So that, that would be for me the only reason why not to do it, an economical part in short crops, but in general, yeah, just what you also say, Andrew, it's, it's, it's the added value of having extra yield. You can elongate your cycle and you have the disease resistant package, which in general, not all varieties, uh, an heirloom is there a very nice example for, have. They, uh, they are, many uh, varieties don't have the complete resistant package. So that's, uh, yeah. I think there is, uh, uh, yeah, the only reason why not to do it is for when it's a very short cycle. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, for example, here, like California, for example, there's a huge market for determinate, uh, like, paste tomatoes that they're going to make into ketchup and sauces and things like that, right? And so I don't think, you know, uh, that they're ever going to start grafting those plants um, just because the yeah, short cycle, they're basically like com almost like combining them, you know? So, yes, yeah. it, it, but I think a lot of like fresh market growers, I guess, is, you know, have a lot to get out of, um, yeah. of, of grafting. So I've been told that the adoption in Dutch greenhouses went first. Um, and then that grafting caught on in the high tech greenhouses here in North America after it had become established in, in Holland. And I think that widespread use by smaller growers, like I imagine are in our audience, took a little longer. Whenever people ask me about the benefits of rootstocks, I always tell people that rootstocks will make the plant more vigorous, that vigor can be turned into extra yield, and additionally, the broad disease resistance to soil-borne disease will help the plants not get sick. Is there anything else you would tell people about the advantages of grafting? I've seen literally hundreds of, of rootstock varieties. Uh, yeah. Also, the ones which did not become commercial, the majority, unfortunately, did not become commercial. But the, the striking thing I see, and, and unfortunately, um, those so far never became commercial, was the taste component. Mm -hmm. And you see sometimes, when we are looking about vigor, power, but sometimes a rootstock can also give generativity. And generativity can equal 
uh, a taste increase. So we even saw some rootstocks in my, my trials in the past where we saw a, 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 not a, a yield increase, but a taste increase. So but unfortunately, the, the varieties on the market so far, their focus, uh, the number one focus is vigor, long cycle. But, um, but there are possibilities. Uh, the, Possibilities are endless, but the, the taste is not something people first think about if they think about rootstocks. Uh, and also there, if you compare Estamino, for instance, uh, where, you, where you started with, and Espartano, which is way more vigorous, the, the bricks and taste, but let's measure uh, here bricks of Estamino, is higher than that one of Espartano, because Espartano is more more powerful, puts their energy more into the leaves, which later on can be get into yield. And Estamino is more generative and puts its energy more on the fruits and on the quality of its fruits, eh? the taste, uh, for instance. But yeah, unfortunately, that's not the main driver, the main reason for the rootstocks. Uh, growers often search for science, which have a good taste eh? or have a good yeah, uh, flavor, uh, quality, whatever. So not really, uh, uh, the driver is not really the rootstock. But it, it is possible. Uh, there is variation in rootstocks which can increase or decrease taste. Well, that is that is really interesting to me because I know that in the uh, cucurbit grafting, so uh, we haven't really talked about this, but I, um, uh, I should say that it's also possible to graft the cucurbit family. So the cucumbers and winter squashes and summer squashes and things like that. And yeah. um, because I, that's another thing that I worked on. And sometimes cucurbit rootstocks can have a pronounced impact on flavor. And I was, I was not aware that, that tomato rootstocks really had much of an impact. In fact, I thought that's what, it's one of the nice things about tomato grafting is because with cucurbit grafting, you have to be very careful about the combination because I've heard of certain rootstocks giving cucumbers sort of like a melon flavor or just like an off flavor. Yeah. yeah. And so in if you want to graft cucurbits, you have to be very careful about um, what combination you make as far as rootstock and top variety. So I always thought like, well, that's a big bonus for tomatoes yeah. is that you don't have to worry so much about that combination. No, but that's bad. In, in tomato, it really has to do with generativity. And in general, if you steer a crop more generative, you, increase, you decrease food size maybe, but you increase flavor in general. So because some varieties are more generative than others, you see that uh, increase of flavor with generative rootstock versus very vegetative, strong, vigorous rootstocks. Well, that's good to know. I mean, I honestly, I could see some of the growers in our community maybe even choosing let's say um let's say estamino over espartano so uh, a less uh i could see some of our growers choosing the the, the more flavorful rootstock because with our 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 um group of mostly smaller more direct to market growers of course they want a good yield right that's still how everybody gets paid but you know i figure like farmers market growers you know, their customers don't care how much yield they're getting. They they're gonna come back to their their market table based on who has the tastiest tomato. So Absolutely. so that's that's super interesting um, to me. And so yeah. just to also to back up a little bit, if our audience isn't used to talking about say generativity versus the, the vegetativity of a plant, am I right that by by gen by saying that a, a rootstock or a plant is more generative, that it's channeling more of its energy into flowers and fruit, and if it's more a, a strongly vegetative plant, it's more like building the leaves and growing the vine faster. Is it? Is there anything? Is that right, yeah. or is there anything you would add to that? In general, that, that's completely right. The generative one is really focusing on the generative parts of a plant, which is the flowers in general. Flowers uh, turn into uh, to fruits, and the vegetative parts are the the leaves, the side shoots, uh, the stem, um, and you see that more strong uh, vegetative rootstocks have a thicker stem, a bit more anthocyanin in the head, uh, darker leaves, broader leaves, um, which for a grower may be very interesting to turn that into generativeness. If a variety is already generative, as a grower, you can play less with that variety because, uh, yeah, 
it's already generative. You cannot steer it even more generative because then, yeah, the plant can, well, turn on negative for you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, generative uh, and vegetative, that are the two, um, yeah, the two, two sides of the, of the story. And we would like to have a balance between both. And there is a variety difference of that balance. Some go more towards generative and others more towards vegetative. Yeah. Right. Okay. And um, all right. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying because that's, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with those terms. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we did a, um, an interview with Guillaume Lambert, who is a, uh, he's has a, the company Arisha. It's a greenhouse automation company from up in Quebec. Actually, we talked pretty extensively about vegetative and generative steering. So if people want to know more about that, uh, we could talk about that all day long, I'm sure, but we shouldn't. We should stick to rootstock. So if people want to see more, hear more about generative and vegetative steering, um, they can go back and listen to the com- the conversation with Guillaume Lambert from um, Orisha. One way that I think about it is that a stronger plant just has more energy that, like you said, you can either steer it um, towards putting more energy into the fruit by the the ways that you have to steer the plant or if the plant let's say the there's any kind of stress like temperature stress pests diseases or anything that will weaken a plant if it's being afflicted by pests or diseases or anything even temperature stress and so it's it's helpful to have more vigor in that a, a plant with more vigor can over has more energy to overcome the stresses that may come come with the season um <laughs> Although, like you said, you, they want it to be balanced. You know, the bad, like if, if there's too much vegetative energy, you know, what I tell people, it's like a, it's like a plant growing out of a compost pile. Do you know what I mean? How it's like super, super dark green leaves it grows, grows really fast, but sometimes very s- small fruit. Sometimes it even skips the first fruit cluster because it's so, it's so focused on putting its energy into growing the leaves in the vine. It kind of like forgets about the fruit. And so that's why, as with so many things in life, the, the the goal is to find a balance. But, you know, if you have that energy in the first place, uh, you know, that's why with really weak varieties, like there are some, you know, growers may know uh, a variety, maybe they like the flavor a lot, but the variety is very weak. And that way, if they run into trouble, like there's a really hot week or they get some kind of pest or disease, that plant can kind of peter out uh, because the 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 environmental conditions or pests or diseases can, can sap that plant's energy and it may not have enough energy to, to bounce back. Whereas if you have, you you have a lot of vigor that can help a plant overcome all those, those stresses. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. For a long time, at least here in the U S the main variety available was, was called maxi fort. In fact, I was part, uh, as I mentioned, I was part of the team that added Estamino uh, to the lineup probably about eight years ago now. And, and I see you have this new, even stronger rootstock, Espartano. Uh, plus, you have a FlexiFort cucumber rootstock. Um, and back when I was wrapping up my trialing days, it seemed like the trend was towards more tightly segmented varieties. For example, lower vigor, more generative varieties for smaller fruited tomatoes. Uh, and I see that you now have this really high vigor Espartano and then maybe varieties for niches such as tolerance to salty soils and cold soil tolerance and things like that. Um, what is the trend in, in, in rootstock breeding um, these days? Of course, as a seed company, we would like to have one variety which can fit all. Well, that's unfortunately not, 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 not possible, but it, it really goes, in, in our opinion, towards two, two segments. One, mm-hmm. long crop with lots of uh, yeah, high tech growing, uh, pushing to the limit, finding that 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 last piece of of plant which they can can push even more. So, number one in rootstock development, vigor as much as possible. Um, that's that's something which is well almost mainstream. However, a growing upcoming part is more towards generativity. Energy prices are going, at least in Europe, through the roof. Vigor is nice if you can make it into yield. And in order to make vigor into yield, you need to put CO2, temperature, EC, whatever to do to make that plant generative. But if price of of energy is going up, 
you cannot it's 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 too costly to make that that plant generative so we see that growers also are thinking of going towards more generative not weak but more generative rootstocks so where in the past the sky was the limit and in in many growers it's still there eh? as vigorous as possible because then i have room to play now it it's it tends to go more and more towards okay do i need a maximum figure because it's too costly to get the maximum yield out of it uh-huh. out of that very vigorous one so and then what you say then yeah if you cannot um get the the figure into generativity fruits will stay low of a uh, small you get missetting, you get irregularities because you cannot tame the variety, so to say. So it's um, we do see a yeah, direction going more towards uh, strong generative, so not vegetative, but strong generative, um, and a team, but that we are not there yet. Yeah, you already mentioned salinity, drought. Uh, there is the, the variation in wild relatives in tomato is huge. We, 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 are not, we did not discover everything yet. So the next thing, um, uh, the, the big thing we are also focusing on is, yeah, is the abiotic stresses. And that can be different things, but I can imagine uh, water shortage, water quality, soil uh, quality, um, uh, salinity. So those complex teams... For the future, that are the, the important topics. But for now, one part is figure because that's existing. That's the request which is already existing for years. And strong generative. So more, less energy, to put less energy into it to get uh, uh, your maximum out of your variety. So, yeah. So, yes, there are niche, niches, but not so, not the real small niches. It's really two directions, so to say. That makes sense. Um, and actually, you just you just brought up something that's that's interesting to me about um, that they're still discovering a new um, like wild tomato relatives. And, and when people ask me why the rootstocks have so much more vigor, I tell them that they're the mules of the plant world, the result of an interspecific cross between tomato relatives that results in higher vigor than any solanum like a persicum like the regular garden variety tomato um varieties and so um i feel like we have a pretty nerdy audience you know i like i'm interested in the why behind the why you know because like because like when you know people have asked you know are like well why are they so high in vigor and that's you know when i say well they're the result of an interspecific cross and so like i like mules right because mules uh, people are familiar with mules it's uh, you know a horse and a donkey uh have offspring and has different traits like i mean right. m- like my family actually no my family had farm in pennsylvania um and they preferred mules you know they thought they were stronger and more resilient and you know they had the big ears you know they definitely they're definitely a little different than a horse or a donkey it's this other thing and so i was told that that um there's genetics coming from basically like close tomato relatives like Solanum pimpinellifolium, Solanum hirsutum, like all these things that are probably, I'm assuming they're, they're like wild tomato relatives out in, in so- South or Central America, you know, in the, the homeland of tomatoes. And I'm sure you can't tell me like what the actual crosses are, but is that true? Are, are pretty much all the tomato rootstocks interspecific crosses? The majority is. We, we have in Asia, or we in general in Asia, where you have lots of bacterial wilt problems, uh, Ralstonia, you see that they use resistant normal varieties, which, which are resistant, but don't have the food quality, don't have the yield potential. They use that as a rootstock. For us, that's not the market we are playing in. We are 100% playing in the interspecific cross. And... My first, I, I told you that Estamino was my second commercial variety. My first one was Efialto. And Efialto was a cross between a Solanum lycopessicum, so a normal tomato, and a Solanum pimpinellifolium, which is a very small cherry, well, micro cherry acid. Well, but the 
plant was so extreme from each other, we call that heterosis, which is one plus one equals three. So it's the hybrid is outperforming the the uh, the, yeah, the performance of both uh, the sum of both parents, and that's where we are looking at. And but the negative thing of pimpernel as a as a as a male was lack of vigor. It's very pimpernel folium as such, such is generative, and the esculentum as such was also generative. So you cross generative times generative equals well really generative. Uh, so we stepped away from that. Uh, it has no crossing barrier whatsoever. So it was easy to combine. Good quality, seed size, all fine. But we went away from it. And now, and not only ours, in general, 99% uh, of our, our breeding contains out Solanum habogaitis. You mentioned it, Sutem, which is the old naming of what's now called habogaitis. Oh, okay. Um, which is um, a wild species, hairy, well, not eatable, you don't recognize it as a tomato, comes from the Andes between 500 and 2,000 meter altitude. So that having said, a nice thing why we combine it, because it is like a mule, they are both totally different. You combine them and the offspring is also, inf you have problems in germination, Your, the offspring is infertile, which a mule is also infertile. So in many ways, That uh, what you mentioned is really true also for Woodstock. But if you look at all the traits available, if you genotype them, they are totally different. Genotypically, they are totally different. Um, if you look at the root architecture, where tomato, the normal tomato has shallow roots, the habogaitis has pen roots. So the hybrid, you can imagine, has both pen roots and shallow roots. Well, that is a motor. That is the pump of the rest of the plant. Because it comes, especially in soil, in places where the normal tomato will not reach. So that is a big added value of the um, yeah of using a wild habogaitis as a meal in uh, uh, an, an, an F1 hybrid. But it comes with producibility issues, lower seed quality. So you have to do a lot. You have to prime it. Uh, you have to clean it out to get to an, a commercial batch which is sellable. So uh -huh. it comes with quite some penalties, but the, the added value is so big that we work on those those difficulties because the added value is is really, uh, really huge. Yeah. And that's also what you, what you say. Eh? You, you clearly see the difference between grafted and ungrafted. And if you dig out the roots, you will see a massive difference uh, in, 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 in root phenotype. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I've I've seen that done in hydroponics where they they pull out a regular tomato plant and then they pull out the grafted the rootstock and it's the grafted one is much more massive and also much more tap rooted. And in fact, exactly. that's one thing I I've heard from some growers that they can actually back off on fertilizer a little bit. And I'm talking about soil growing here because I think the root the the root system just pulls from such a bigger area and is more yeah. efficient. Like it goes out and find, you know, covers a, the root system covers a bigger area and goes and kind of finds that fertility that growers can actually you maybe even use a little bit less. And, and the nice thing is we used to be market leader in, in Chile, in Arica, which is uh -huh. a, a, an area famous for its salty stress, uh, uh, low, uh, yeah, salt quality, uh, yeah, salty salts. And our rootstock was doing very well. And I don't only think about its tolerance against Uh, the salty soil, but also because the roots, they they grow so fast. So if one root gets problems with the soil, there is another one and another one and another <laughs> one. The roots go, grow faster than the salt kills it. So also there, um, there is like a field tolerance because of using an interspecific uh, cross. So it's, yeah, for abiotic stresses also there, in general, rootstocks will do better than non-crafted uh, uh, varieties. Yeah. Well, we, yeah, we see the result of that. Where we are is so cold that we stopped growing large fruited tomatoes out in the field. But mm -hmm. the, the last thing that we kept growing out in the field is very small fruited cherries and grape tomatoes. And so I think just because I was a nerd about it, um, I think I tried grafting some plants for our field tomatoes 
And, but mm, it wasn't intentionally set up as a trial, but we had some grafted plants and some ungrafted plants. And one of the things that I noticed the most was since we're so far north, we start having very cold nights just by August and September can be ve getting very cold. In fact, we usually have our first frost in September, like the third week of September here. And one, what we noticed is that the grafted plants kept pushing fruit much later into the season, whereas the, the ungrafted plants, they weren't dead, but they weren't really like making a lot more fruit. And so, I mean, I think that just gets back to what you were saying about abiotic stresses. Like for, for listeners, it, what we mean by abiotic stresses, right, is non is not pests and diseases. It's stresses like right. temperature, so, yeah. salinity, or yeah. like it's the non the non living things that yeah, are going to stress exactly, your plant exactly. out. Okay. Because the wild species, yeah, if you are, if you can survive in two thousand meters in the Andes or other species on the Galapagos Islands on the beach, yeah, if you can survive there, yeah, if you use that genetics in your variety, yeah, then you can imagine it, it brings that, uh, uh, yeah, that, that uh, flexibility into the hybrid. Right, because the, the homeland of the tomato in Central and South America, a lot of the places where the, where the tomato developed is kind of a rough growing environment, right? can be very hot at, at the daytime, can get very cold at night. And so the plants have to be very resilient to, to survive there. Yeah. So, And I know that's, that's a technique used not just with tomatoes. I know that um, breeders are, uh, oftentimes will go to the, the homeland of a particular crop, right? To go f try and find new uh, or like different um, genes and traits. And we're talking conventional breeding here, just birds and the bees, you know? Uh, exactly. Although nowadays uh, there is huge, uh, especially uh, there are huge gene banks in uh, in the US. The USDA has a, a, a big one where we can order wild species. We are not allowed anymore from the 90s already, I, uh, I think early 90s, to go to the Andes and say, hey, here I am, oh, this is nice, because it owns, hey, Chile or Peru owns that genetics. We cannot just come there, take it and, and make money with it. So now um, there are regulations in place that if we make money for it, the original country should also benefit from it. So, um, um, yeah, so yes, we use a genetic uh, of new species, new, new, new wild species, but we are not shopping anymore in the, 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 the yeah, in the, in the Andes. Uh, we are using the gene banks in the US to, to order uh, new accessions or, or existing uh, described accessions that are wild species we call accessions, yeah. That is very interesting. Um, I yeah, I was gonna ask actually if you guys had were sending people to try and find wild tomato relatives. So are those countries doing that? So what like Chile and um, other Andean countries? Are they do they have biologists out there? Because I would think. I mean, I don't know, but I would think there might still be undiscovered um, for sure solanum yeah. species out there in the wild, right? Yeah. Okay, so maybe they they have their own biologists who are looking for them. Yeah. Yeah, but it's now organized in a different way and not like, oh, we go shopping and we hide it because we are a commercial company. Uh -huh. No, that's now been done uh, locally and shared. But yeah. it will be a fair pay, uh, a fair deal, a fair pay uh, yeah. for that, which 100% makes sense. That's great. That does does make a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, the, the variation is huge. Uh, so there are lots of accessions already known, but... What you say, there, there must be way more out there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting to think about a, some interesting wild tomato relative out there that might have, um, you know, resistance to some disease that that could be come important in the future. Yeah. My last question for you about the whole idea of of interspecific crosses is. Um, I was told that in certain crops, the hybridizing, so taking a parent, you know, creating offspring from a parent that's two two different parents, as opposed to um, an open pollinated variety. So some crops, hybridizing has a big impact in, like most of the corn varieties that are grown, uh, you know, in North America or anywhere. I would think are 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 hybrids because I was told that corn, for example, has a fairly big reaction. It has when you when you take two uh, two different parents, it makes a big vigor increase in uh, in corn. But I was told that tomatoes don't have such a huge 
thing. Like, I think if you took, you know, brandy wine and you crossed it to Cherokee purple, like just to take, just to take open pollinated varieties that, that our growers may be f- familiar with, like you may get a tomato that's somewhere between brandy wine and Cherokee purple, but it's not going to be like this super vigorous um, thing. And, but that that's where we get back to the mule analogy. So is, I was told, and can you confirm this for me, that in tomatoes, to get the real full benefit of hybrid vigor, you have to make that an interspecific cross because am, am I right that the, the, the wider a cross is in, in vegetable breeding, plant breeding in general, um, meaning how the, the one parent is as different as possible, the more different the two parents are from each other, that tends to increase the amount of hybrid vigor. And so is, is that correct? Is that why the interspecific cross, you're getting so much more vigor than just a regular tomato-tomato cross? And then, uh, 100%, the heterosis is extreme. So heterosis, one plus one is three, is extreme in rootstocks because we are talking here about a wild species, not even close to tomato, barely crossable with a normal tomato. However, in tomato itself, of course, yeah, two heirlooms together, which already genotypically, yeah, uh, they look a lot like each other. They both don't have resistances. They both are big sized. But if you go already a bit farther away, crossing a cherry times a beef will already give you heterosis, will already give you one plus one is three, less than with rootstock, but still you will see figure increase. If you cross a cherry times a cherry, fully agree with you, you don't see that uh, so extreme, but a resistant cherry times a susceptible cherry, a determinant, uh, a field cherry times a greenhouse cherry, to within the cherry, look for extremes, still you can find heterosis. So not as extreme, but you will find one plus one is three. So it's that's the fun of doing breeding. It's not crossing a good parent times a good parent, because then you get a good hybrid. No, uh-huh. you are crossing an ugly resistant parent times a beautiful non-tasting parent, and you get an exceptional variety. Uh-huh. But yeah, you get also lots of ugly varieties because yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all about genetics. Sometimes my sister looks a lot like my mother, and I'm unfortunately look a lot like my father. So <laughs> <laughs> they could not expect <laughs> yeah you don't know that on forehand so it's lots of trialing but heterosis for us as breeders is the basis of making a successful variety searching for extremes parents don't need to be beautiful because they need to be extreme so that's a little bit insight about breeding the, the, the rest is magic but this is uh, uh, the basis looking for extremes that's very interesting because occasionally I've gotten the question from a grower who I think wants to save a few bucks is maybe in, in, intrigued by grafting, but wants to save a few bucks on, on say rootstock seed. And I've gotten the question like, well, can I just take a really vigorous garden variety, variety tomato and just graft on that and get a yield boost? And I actually tried that in my, you know, in my, in my trial. So like, I don't know if you know the variety sun gold, it's a, it's a hybrid yeah. cherry tomato, very, yeah. you know, real like as cherry tomatoes tend to be, but also very vigorous variety. And so, you know, just to try that hypothesis, I did, I did some plants where I used sun gold as the uh, rootstock and it wasn't very impressive. You know, it was about just compared to the, the plants grafted on actual rootstocks, it did, it was way, way behind in vigor yeah. and yield and all that kind of stuff. Just, but I can imagine without grafting that it had an added value because uh, the, the vigor comes from somewhere and often it comes from the roots. Uh-huh. So maybe Sungot does have a better root system than the original cyan. So if you use it, it can have added value, but by far not as big added value as a rootstock. By far, it's it's yeah, so it can have an effect, but not the effect as you normally would see by a commercial rootstock. It's a specific rootstock. You cannot uh, get to that level. Y- so, yeah, that yeah. that was my experience, and I mean, you know, that was yeah, one of the fun yeah. things yeah. about doing trials is I could try, you know, try stuff. But yeah, I don't have access to that data anymore. But what I remember is that the sun gold is pretty unexceptional as a rootstock. You know, all all the actual rootstocks way way outperformed it. Yeah. 
then, uh, then you're also dealing with, uh, with resistances. And not all uh, science have the, the whole resistance package. And uh, in rootstocks, we don't have to deal with food quality, with taste, with how beautiful a food looks. It has to be resistant and it has to well, be producible and preferably strong. So, yeah, nobody cares if it's nice, shiny fruit because you, you graft them. You don't see those nice, shiny fruits. So there is way more space on the genome to focus on resistances. Whereas in science, you have to focus on the looks, on how nice the plant looks, how easy it sets. How... There is not that much space on the genome to also add <coughs> resistances to the equation. So it's, it makes sense that there are no, not always all the resistances in the, in the science. Because, yes. yeah, there's, there's no space. Well, that makes yeah. sense. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned that because I always think of plant breeding as kind of like a compromise. Is like there's very few, like, perfect varieties out there and you know in any if there are any perfect varieties there's probably about to be some new disease that's going to take them out but um you know i figure like if you're shopping for tomatoes you you know there's a lot of demands made on breeders right do you want mm -hmm. fruit that tastes good that also looks nice for whatever your market is you know if you have a market for beef steaks it's got to be what your customer expects that to look like if it's a cherry it's got to look like what your customer expects it to look like but you also want high vigor and disease resistance and a good root system. And so I figure like, does it make sense? But I, I've, I've always felt like rootstock breeding is almost more of a breeding trick than any kind of a plant husbandry trick because right for, I'm, I'm imagining f for say you as the breeder, instead of having to have like, you know, 20 different, 20 different goals in mind, including, you know, like good leaves, good fruit and all these above ground parts, right? If you're breeding a rootstock, you can, like you said, you can just forget about all the, it doesn't matter how bad the fruit is. It doesn't matter how bad the leaves are, as long as it has a good root system and in good disease resistance and, you know, the, the vigor that you're looking for, right? It means you can, you can like add, you know, breed exclusively for traits for only half the plant. And so make almost like a super, you know, super roots and, and forget, forget about what the, the fruit is like in the leaves and all that kind of stuff. Exactly that. Because I, I I tried that too. I, I I grew. I took some root stalks and let them grow. Like I had, you know, at the ends of rows, I had like we usually didn't use the last few plants in a row because the the ends were kind of like there's always variability at the ends of rows, and so I had uh, guard, like we guard plants. So you know, one time I put some root stalks, just let the root root stalks grow on their own roots, and I'd say, <laughs> first of all, the fruit yield was very low, and it was very I ate some of them, but they were gross. Oh, so they are workable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Been there, done that. It's not correct. Correct. Yeah. And am I correct that in grafting, we're just taking advantage of the plant's natural ability to heal itself, and we're just healing it to a different plant, right? Because if you know, like, let's say if you if you accidentally snapped a tomato stem, mm -hmm. and maybe if it was a a really overcast humid day and not too hot you might be able to put it back or like i've done this in my greenhouse where I accidentally like in lowering and leaning accidentally snap a stem and as long as it's not completely broken off i would take a splint and just take like some duct tape or electrical tape exactly. wrap it wrap it back up and just heal it so yeah. what you're doing with grafting is you're just you're taking advantage of that ability of the plant to heal itself just to a different plant is that right correct we the we want to have the maximum amount of surface. So what we do is a 45 degrees angle. Yeah, to, if you put it like uh, uh, horizontal, there is a limited amount of yeah, surface. So if you do a 45% angle of a degree angle, there is more surface to connect with. So that's the first thing we do. Then uh, we put, we, we put uh, uh, some do tape. We have ending clips, a sort of plastic rubbery clips. And then for a week in a tent, high humidity, yeah, that, uh, because the roots, you don't want uh, the plant to, to directly get all the, the humid from the, uh, the, the liquid from the, uh, the roots, because that connection is not so good yet. So the, uh, you do high humidity in a tent, you wait uh, a week, and yeah, when I do it myself, it's 80% more or less succeeding, but people who really can do it, 
95% is, 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 is doable, is reachable. So not too old plants, eh? young plants, seedlings, like uh, seven to 10 days old. Eh? The, the smaller the plants are, the easier they are recoverable. It's, you cannot, well, you barely cannot kill it. It's, that's the fun thing with tomato. And pepper, it's a bit more difficult because they are more woody structures. Uh, but we also graft uh, eggplants under toma uh, tomatoes, rootstock, eggplant, cyan. So also there, uh, it, it works very well. So it's, it's yeah, very versatile uh, and, and yeah, high, high succeeding range. And that's, that's, yeah, then it makes it economically interesting. If, uh, if there is 40% of succeeding range, yeah, then it's very costly to do the grafting. But if, the, if 90 five percent is succeeding perfect yeah yeah well that's a really good point people may not know that you can also graft with like you said eggplants um peppers and the whole the whole cucurbit family um at least when well, i yeah. was doing it the cucurbits that i grafted with are to be more specific so i i grafted cucumbers for greenhouse cucumber trials and one thing i saw was i didn't see a big yield boost and I think like you were saying, because there, I think it, what we might say is we have a bigger land base here in the U.S. as far as we have more land in relation to the number of people that need to be fed. And also a lot of our land hasn't been grown on as, perhaps as, as, as like you were saying, as intensively or, or um, hasn't been cropped in the same crop so that it, uh, there's not as much soilborne disease pressure. And I when I grafted with with cucumber rootstocks, I I didn't see a yield boost, and I didn't think it would catch on with U.S. growers until there was a yield boost, like you have in tomatoes. Just because the the, the maybe you know maybe if some grower their only cu cucumber house is contaminated, but I thought most growers in the U.S. I don't think are going to do cucumber grafting unless they can also get that yield boost. Are there cucumber rootstocks out there, do you know, that are offering a yield boost or is it still more of a disease resistant thing in uh, cucumbers? Again, I'm, I'm not a specialist in, in uh, cucumber of cucumber to say rootstocks. Okay. But what I know is that the genetic difference, and we are really in tomato using a wild, very distant species with a normal tomato. In cucumber, they are, the, the variation they can use Still, a melon and a, and a cucumber is something different, but they are all, they are genetically not so extremely different. So you have less heterosis, and therefore that yield boost, the vigor boost, there is less heterosis. So if there is less heterosis, there is less of a yield boost. So and and the same counts as far as I know so far for pepper. For pepper rootstocks, eh? uh, also Enza worked on it. Also, we had one commercial variety, but mainly to cover fusarium, for instance, uh, not to get that 10% yield boost. And you do need this 10% in order to cover, and you have to buy two seeds. So if you want to make that economically interested, you need an X amount of extra yield. So that's in cucumber and pepper, we really see it occurring for their yeah, uh, resistances, soy-borne resistances, uh, and not yet, but uh, the, also there, the, maybe not all the variation is exploited yet, mm -hmm. but at this moment, no, it's, it's, it's not getting that, that extreme yield boost, yeah. as you can see in tomato. Yeah, that's kind of what I, uh, that's what I experienced doing, because I, yeah, I did the trials on Grafted eggplant, grafted pepper, and also grafted cucumber in addition to, to tomatoes. And in, in all my trials, the grafted plants always outperformed the ungrafted plants. In fact, you, you mentioned that 10% yield boost, which is about along the lines of what I heard from most of the high tech you know, so mm -hmm. the, uh, just for our audience, I'm going to say what I mean by high tech is you know, fancy you know, more like glass greenhouses with a lot of automated heating and humidity and, 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 you know, very, uh, a lot of control over the environment. And so those, yeah, those growers told me they were getting more like 10%. Honestly, the, the, the growers that are more low tech, which is more, more like my greenhouses here mm -hmm. in Maine. And also yeah. actually more similar to the kind of trials that I was doing at the time. So, 
even more it was more like 20 or 30 percent and i th i thought that that was because in those big high-tech greenhouses they've already optimized everything right the fertility the the climate the temperature like they've already they've already optimized almost everything and that the grafting was like a little boost on top of that and i've at least what i always assumed was that in the sort of like more low-tech greenhouses everything wasn't quite as optimized the, the climate wasn't as optimal uh maybe fertility and everything else and it seemed like what i was seeing was that that extra vigor from the rootstock was helping the plant overcome the stresses and so that was my hypothesis for why we were actually seeing an even bigger yield boost in lower tech or less fancy greenhouses than in the the real like the real fancy greenhouses and so of course those those growers still wanted that 10 percent. you know it was like 10 percent on top of an already pretty huge yield number but I, I, um it was just interesting to me that it's almost it's like even more impactful in a way for for growers who haven't already optimized all their other conditions for sure because what i mentioned eh, if your genetics comes from the andes uh, it's well it's it's pretty flexible it can survive quite a bit and if you have a stressful uh, uh, environment especially those rootstocks will will benefit so i fully understand uh, of, i can imagine the yield boost is way more there i see the same uh, in spain where we have non-heated greenhouses or tunnels um, uh, often also soil or coca peat yeah, and there in winter time it just they don't heat. So in winter time, it can get eight degrees in the in the night. Well, a normal tomato, uh, if you go from eight degrees in in a day during the day, it can become eighteen or twenty degrees Celsius. Covering cold, warm, cold, warm. A normal tomato will be stressed out. A rootstock thinks, okay, come on, uh, give me more. And that's the, there you see more added value than. In Holland, for instance, high tech, where you say, oh, the temperature cannot go below this. And during the day, it cannot go below of above that. And you can, on the minor details, you can work on your crop. You can get maximum out of it. Well, in Spain, for instance, you cannot get, you have hope that, your, that the nights will not be too cold. But you cannot do anything about it. Yeah, you can keep the, freeze, the, the frost out by having... Uh, a gas heater or so, but yeah, if it's eight degree, it's eight degree. Uh, there is mm -hmm. nothing you can do, uh, and the plants just have to deal with it. And that's uh, the rootstock really helps you there. Yeah, yeah, right. It ca calls on its Andean ancestors to be strong through those co cold nights. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, All right. Uh, so I switched entirely over to grafted plants, but occasionally I would hear from someone saying that they trialed grafted plants and that the grafted plants didn't do better. And honestly, this always puzzled me because I have had such good luck with grafted plants. But my best guess was that either their plants didn't heal properly. Do you know what I mean? How sometimes a plant, sometimes when you graft a plant, it will survive, but the, it's, if it wasn't a very good graft, some, occasionally it's like all the, maybe all the vascular structure didn't match up on the, the outside of the plant. Or maybe sometimes the vigor was so high, perhaps also if people had a lot of fertilizer, like too much, you know, combination of a very vigorous plant plus too much fertilizer maybe made their plants just way too vegetative and, and yield was, was compromised. But I wanted to ask if those explanations make sense to you or if you can think of any other reasons why grafted plants might not mm -hmm. outpour, outperform ungrafted plants. The, the healing part... I've seen it in some occasions, but not so so severe. In general, tomato is just like a, a weed. You cannot kill it, or barely. Eh? It will always try to survive. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I do see, um, especially people who have N normal, not crafted, and crafted in the same tunnel and in the same greenhouse, whatever, that they manage on the ungrafted part. So what you say, uh, the nutrients... Yeah, maybe the ungrafted ones need a bit, an X amount of, of nutrients in order to survive, to get the plant uh, growing. And most often the, the rootstock can grow deeper, find its own nutrients also. So, and it gets nutrients from the soil and it gets the extra nutrients from the grower. 
and it has extra vigor by itself, then you then it becomes leafy. You get smaller fruit size. Um, and if you then don't de-leaf or don't stress it more or, or put an extra stem, uh, you can keep a side shoot in order to have two heads with one stem, which balance it out. Yeah, then it goes out of hand. It gets too vegetative and you don't have the added value. But if you treat it, if you now if you play with the figure by de-leaving, by putting an extra stem, I I don't hear about uh, uh, being a failure in combination if you compare it with non-grafted. However, you have to treat it differently. Yeah, a grafted crop is different than a non-grafted. You have yeah, there, there's a different growing management. So yeah. Uh, yeah, if you you think of the same crop as last year, but now it's grafted, look at the plant and F, uh, look at the plant. That that would be my thing. If you see a very bushy, full plant, yeah, take yeah, take leaves out, do something that you get that figure down. Um, and if you don't do that, yeah, then it will be a failure, so to say, uh, compared to non-grafting. But in general. No, I, yeah. I, I cannot uh, say grafting is is less positive than non-grafting in, in, right. in, in all the trials I've seen. No. Yeah, well, I, I would agree with that. In I mean, uh, my my general recommendation for people is mm -hmm. unless the unless the cyan variety, unless the top variety is really really weak, you know, to just go ahead and do two heads. Um, then of course, and yeah, that will help. That will help kind of like tame tame the plant. And there's a lot of resources out there. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned it. It should be strong enough. If with heirloom, for instance, I would not go for two heads or whatever. keep it one on one grafted. Uh -huh. But yeah, with more with the cherry you mentioned, but also with and the other beef variety, which is more more vigorous. Yeah, two heads is easy it's easy to do for, for the roots. Right? They can handle it. So that's, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so it's a good, good point though, that the man plant management might be a little different for if, if growers yeah. are making that transition from ungrafted to grafted plant management may be a little different. And if they, yeah. I think if they learn how to manage those plants, they can get more out of them. But, uh, exactly. okay. Exactly. Yeah. So one of the things that has hindered the adoption of grafted plants, um, I think by some smaller growers here in North America is the lack of a bit of availability of small amounts of grafted plants. Um, so many growers have had to learn how to do it if they wanted plants. For example, I know there's, there's a lot of places that do grafting here in North America, but a lot of them are really focused on the bigger growers. They'll have like a thousand or 2000 plant minimum have to be all the same variety. So it's not, it's not very accessible. And so, you know, maybe seven or 10 years ago, I thought that there would be more of a development of a, of places that would do gr grafting for people, right? So if, if they're like, I just want to grow the plants. I don't want to become a grafting expert. I don't even want, exactly. I don't like, I don't like that kind of work that there would be more places where people could buy them. And I, there's some places where people can uh, order them through the mail. And in fact, actually one year, I think I mentioned that my, my wife, Annie has a nursery business. One year mm -hmm. we did some custom grafting for other growers. Actually. I mean, I, I did the grafting and, uh, and it worked. The, it worked out well. The plants were fine. It's just I, I didn't. I don't have enough time to to do that. So, um, do you know if small numbers of grafted plants are available to Dutch growers, or are smaller scale Dutch growers doing their own grafting? Unfortunately, there are less and less small scale Dutch growers. Yeah. So the, the economy of scale in Holland is really taking off. So you see that there will be less growers, but the growers which are there, the acreage is still the same or increasing a bit, but the amount of growers is rapidly decreasing. So, but so now plant raisers in general also, hey, we do trials, a lot of trials, and we then go to the plant raiser and say, hey, I have here 10 varieties and I want 40 plants per variety grafted with this variety. So yeah, well, we can do it, but it costs you. 250 euros per variety extra, just to that we say, no, thank you. But we say then, yeah, well, we have to have this trial anyway. But 
uh, plant racers in, in the Netherlands, they really would like to get rid of that. And to be honest, I expected due to the amount of automatization, there are grafting robots and the, that also tailor made, more, more custom, uh, yeah, custom made would say, okay, you want 100 plants of this and 500 of that one. Yeah, we, we sew it, we put it to the grafting robot. I don't see that occurring. I see uh, more cost efficient, one variety, one rootstock, and uh, let's make lots of plants. Yeah. Uh, so I understand what you're saying, but I, I also don't see it in Holland. On contrary, we see that it gets more and more difficult also for us as a seed company to do that externally. So also there, uh, yeah. But we want to have the same plant in the trial as the grower. We don't want to go to another plant raiser. We don't want to do it ourselves. We want to have those plants the same age, the same sowing time, the same yeah, handling as the plants at the grower. So for us also, it's, 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 it's becoming more and more difficult. Yeah. Okay. So maybe not the answer you are hoping for, but I think uh, there we are all in the same boat. Uh, uh, if it's about lower amount of plants crafted. Yeah, sounds like it. Well, and I mean, that's another thing from the little bit that I've traveled in Europe. It seems like um, growers have more access to, to seedlings in general. In fact, um, like here in, in the States, um, it seems like most most of the farmers I know are starting their own plants. And it seems like the, the little bit that I've been in Europe, there is a lot of p- people being able to put in their orders for for seedlings and i don't know if it's just population density or just a longer tradition you know the areas where farming is taking place have already been farmed for longer and maybe there's specialization i don't know that in um in fact we had an article in the magazine about a year ago uh, from a grower i think who was on the outskirts of amsterdam talking about how they just they just order in the, you know, most, most of their plants. And I think it's a great idea, actually, just because growers, growers have so much to worry about already. You know, they, growers wear so many different hats. It makes a lot of sense to me to, let's say, you know, outsource your seedling production. It's just the re, the resources. It's not really a resource that we have here. You know, most, I feel like in, in the, the states and Canada, you know, I think mostly if gr- growers want a particular variety, they just gotta, they gotta make it themselves. And so I was, I was just curious, but, um, uh, that is, that is interesting to me. In the Netherlands, again, they're just like grafting, I think 95, no, I, close to hundred percent is, uh, uh, ordering their plants from the, the plant raiser. They are not yeah. raising their own plants. Yeah, we okay. get a request from the plant raisers. They order seeds to us and say, ah, these seeds are for that grower. Can you send it to us? And they will sow it, graft it, and deliver a X amount of size plant to the, to the grower. They, yeah, that, that's something they really 100% outsource because what you say, growers nowadays, they need to have so many hats, energy, labor, technique, which variety, how to grow, when to do what, how to sell, of, uh, the sales part, it's, yeah. So that's something they, they outsource, the, the, the growing part, the plant raising part. Yeah. yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me, but it's, uh, yeah, I, w- I don't know. Because uh, as I, you know, I want growers to benefit from grafted plants and I, you know, I, I wish, I wish that there were more, like, I don't know. I think from time to time, maybe I could train, maybe I could train some people to do it and make it a part of our nursery. I shouldn't say our nursery, my wife's nursery business. Uh, because, cause I think, you know, like what I don't want, I don't want, I don't want every grower to have to be an expert grafter in order to use grafted plants. Like I, I would like, I would like to see a, like a regional, you know, a lo- local or regional economy of people grafting uh you know for their neighbors basically like if somebody's good at it i would love to see that business develop where they're doing the grafting for their neighbors and so their neighbors don't all have to be grafting experts they can just just order the plant so we're not there yet Uh, that's why i was just curious how it is in in uh in holland so um but that's that makes sense well martin you've been really generous with your time i've really enjoyed uh our conversation today but i just want to make sure is there anything else that i should ask you about you know grafting or or rootstock development or anything else you'd like to talk about before we let you go well 
uh, we talked about it very briefly, and I was saying eh, that that we were also saying that a rootstock is like a mule, and I also said we are crossing um, uh, tomatoes with each other, which is well maximum uh, way farther in the clade. It's not possible. They will you cannot use those uh, wild species for crossing because they, it will not match. However, we also therefore observe germination issues. And, and so having a variety is one, but then making it a commercial interesting variety, and the amount, uh, if we talk about teamwork, the amount of grading, uh, uh, sorting, X, even nowadays X-ray to see if there is an embryo, and if so, if the embryo looks good. There is so much techniques nowadays to, to make this difficult to produce low germinating uh, variety to make it to a standard where growers say, oh, luckily I don't have to sow 150 seeds in order to get 60 seedlings. And so there also due to the t- available techniques, a big improvement there also for the, for the grower uh, to have good germinating seeds with rootstocks. That's quite a thing. Um, that's really uh, for me something at least to mention here that also there we made as a, a seed companies in general a big a big step in the right uh, right direction because these are combinations which are really difficult yeah to do because they are so extreme from each other so that's um, well something I also would like to share that uh, big steps are made there. Yeah. Okay. So there's a, a lot of work, a lot of work from f- finding the cross to actually getting the seed where a grower can just buy the the packet of seeds that's gonna gonna come up with a good germination percentage that they're gonna be happy with and, and all that. Kind and it of sounds stuff. so logical, and it sounds so that you, of course hey, I buy seeds so they are good, but there are so many steps before that, and that's never visible. So I, I'm really grateful, at least to well to make it a bit more visible uh, for you guys. So that's, uh, yeah, that's well, what, yeah, the thing I would like to share. That's worth mentioning that it's a, it's a long, like you said, it's a, maybe a five to seven year road for any given variety. And there's a lot of steps along the way that, that uh, you know, to bring uh, anybody's new, new favorite variety to, to market. So, <laughs> exactly. all right, exactly. well, Martijn, yeah. we appreciate your efforts um, to that end. Enjoy your rootstocks. And this is actually the point in the show. I ask a lot of, of people if they want to share uh, their social media or where they are online. I don't know if you want to do that or just say where people can find, I, I guess, you know, like the Enza website. So maybe they can find uh, w- the distributors. I, you know, that might be a more appropriate thing for you because I know you, you, that Enza has distribution in the U.S. and in Canada, and we also do have, you know, we have listeners internationally as well. You know, most most of our listeners are here in in the U.S. and Canada, but um, I'll I'll just let you take it from there. If you want to direct people over to the Enza website or where you know wherever they can find more, more about what you're what you're doing. Yeah, because on, on the Enza Zade website, which is www.enzazade.com, you also can see the distributor uh, list. The, the thing I'm most proud of, of course, is the amount, uh, the variety. There is a variety listing with a small description per variety. And myself, I'm not the biggest social media person, but I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, well, Martijn van Stee, if you uh, uh, search there, I would be happy to connect. And, and if there are more in detailed questions, of course, maybe I cannot say everything, but in general, I'm as open as I I think I can be so um, always uh, happy to 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 go in contact to, to uh, answer some some other questions. Uh, yeah, always welcome to do so. So it's yeah, great. Well, thank you for that. I've really appreciated um, your thoughts today, and uh, thanks for taking the time out to uh, to talk with us. Okay, it's a pleasure.